Hi everyone, we're back with our Startups in 60 Seconds series. I'm here with the CEO and founder of Ecotextura, Radhika Srinivasan. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi Karthik, thank you for having me. Um, the first question I wanted to ask was, how did you come to found Ecotextura? So this actually goes way back, I think about five, six years. I was actually in and out of hospital quite a lot and uh, for my knee. And um, during my time I had loads of cat, um, uh, CT scans, uh, MRI scans. And whenever I went, they always handed me two patient gowns, one to wear from the front and obviously one to wear from the back for your dignity. Um, and I just thought this was completely inefficient. Um, and being the engineer that I was, uh, I went home and I researched um, patient gowns and PPE and I found it was incredibly, one, inefficient and two, not sustainable at all. So you'd have uh, PPE that was poorly fitting or masks that were poorly fitting, um, made from, you know, petroleum based products, uh, mm -hmm. all plastics, and then they'd be used some some of them will be disposed immediately, some of them will be washed at incredible, incredibly high temperatures, harmful chemicals, um, several times, and then they'd all go for incineration. So mm -hmm. very linear model, and the, the clogs were kind of ticking, uh, turning in my head. And um, I thought, you know what, let's bring the circular economy into this. Is there a way we can make PPE from um, naturally sourced non-woven fibers, mm -hmm. um, make it in a way that is uh, that allows it to be as robust and performing as the existing non-wovens that we have in the medical industry, and then take care of the disposal end of it. So it can be either recycled or um, composted industrially and reused again. So that's essentially where Ecotextura um, how Ecotextural was formed. Okay, so just to clarify, um, in terms of st sustainable fibres, do you mean these are plant-based fibres, it's basically like wood or cloth or something, cotton, for example, that's been specially yeah. processed for this, or can you take any kind of input material in theory? They have to be specially processed. If you actually look at the um, science and performance of various fibres, mm -hmm. um, it will need to undergo some processes for it to be used for non-wovens in the medical industry, for example. Um, also, you can you can manipulate the surfaces of some to have them fluid resistant, etc. So there, there is a bit of um, mechanics and um, materials treatment that is required to get these natural fibres to a place where you can use them for these purposes. Yeah. Now, this sounds like a, a vastly complex set of concepts and, and, and theories to, to implement. And it, it, it's obvious that this has come from research. But we first met, of course, when you were working in the city. So what I wanted to do for the purposes of the, the watches is, is rewind a little bit. What, what was your discipline at university and, and kind of what triggered the thought process for this? Was it relevant or... Was it related in any way? My degree was in mechanical engineering. Um, I did my master's in mechanical engineering and um, business finance, but on the mechanical engineering side, I specialize in production engineering. So essentially bringing a product from the bare minimum sketches and concept to um, scaling it up and having a whole production process for it. So that was mm -hmm. that was my speciality. Um, but going deeper into that, I actually specialized in non-woven um, sustainable fabrics and fibers. I actually selected that um, topic for myself for my bachelor's um, thesis and I worked a whole year on it very intensely um, and that was from my previous experiences in a hospital you know researching Got better ways to um, improve existing PPE. So as I understand it at, at this point in time you're very much focused on using existing and your own PPE sources to make masks and clinical products. Can we talk a little bit more about that and then I want to go on to the, the vision of, of the business. So the current product line and, and who you're selling to. So currently we are selling everything from uh, existing uh, three ply masks, K95 masks, uh, nitrile gloves. Uh, we've also sold patient gowns and um, surgical gowns and, and that's existing PPE. So that's using existing suppliers. Um, on our end, we have uh, produced our own uh, reusable lip reading masks. We saw that there was a oh, huge wow. um, gap in market for these. There were not many um, industries making them and mm -hmm. we're, our brand is all about accessibility, whether that be design accessibility or um, at the price point as well. We just wanna be accessible um, as well as sustainability. So um, these have been made with sustainable fabrics, off-cut fabrics that would have been sent to waste. Um, right. okay. So using um, energy efficient solutions and uh, water and uh, et cetera. So um, that's our own product. And we also have a disposable version for hospitals, which is quite new. Um, 
and this has been gaining a lot of traction. So, so that's our current product offering. Um, and as I mentioned before, in the long term, we also hope to release our own um, non-woven um, fabric made PPE. For the last few months, we've been selling to charities. We've been selling through our e-commerce store um, to NHS trust, medical centers, schools, care homes, NGOs, local councils, you name it. I mean, ev everyone is a customer to us at the moment. As you can got imagine it. and in terms of the, the commercial momentum in terms of how you got your first clients so as i understood it this was started and, and really capitalized by the fact that you were doing some charity work um you're producing the masks delivering them and then how did the the first customer come about it's just incoming leads you didn't really have to approach anyone yeah, yeah the, the the story is when when we went into lockdown we were actually still working on the r d end of eco texture so for, for our long-term uh products and our plan was we we would be doing this for the next two years we weren't mm. we weren't due to make um any revenue or any profits for the first two years it would be purely r d play however when uh the lockdown came into place and uh i i'd already done a lot of research on um reusable masks and their effectiveness so right. i already knew it had to be three layers of tightly um woven cotton i thought you know what let's just let's put the word out let's get a, a team of sewers i sew myself um and i sewed hundreds of masks along with my other fantastic volunteers in the local area and we ended up making and distributing for free 1300 uh masks locally wow. um from this, yeah, it was, it was just fantastic. And we, we, we distributed to care homes, to the elderly, to vulnerable people, to charities, um, which was fantastic. And now what we've been seeing is all the other researchers have been coming through and everyone's being advised to wear these same masks that we were producing yeah. right at the start in March. So from this, um, locally, we were approached by local medical center saying oh you seem to know your stuff with um ppe we've also seen unfortunately a lot of ppe fraud where unfortunately incorrect ppe has been brought into this country yeah. and sold yeah. um so everyone is very trusting of a local source so from there we actually got a lot of contracts and orders to um procure existing ppe for local medical centers um and through that we got a contact um asking if we made um lip reading masks as well uh, which are the clear masks that you can see here. And from that, we were linked to NHS Trust that wanted right. us to, you know, work with them to develop disposable ones, which are suitable in a hospital um, and passed all of their hygiene requirements. And that's how we developed our own over the last few months. And that's kind of how we grew. And, and the word got out more and more. And we are currently known as one of the, um, the lead suppliers for uh, masks for the deaf and hard of hearing. And just to understand the, the procurement process with the NHS then. So first of all, They'll take your product, um, they will put it through their hygiene testing, and presumably at some kind of external lab, and then that's it, they'll place an order, or is that the point at which you join the procurement cycle and you have to go through other certifications, you know, business checks and so on? So, uh, as you can imagine, the NHS is very uh, multi-layered. It's, it's quite hard to get through. So you you either have two options. You can either list on the NHS supply chain. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially a catalogue of all the products from different suppliers that any NHS trust has access to. Right. Um, or you can go to each individual trust. I think there's just over 200 of these um, mm -hmm. across the UK. Um, I think we've managed to target quite a lot at the moment, but we can go to each individual NHS trust and, you know, directly sell the product to them and each nhs trust which is what we've been doing at the moment will request samples to begin with usually they have an internal um hygiene um infection control team so mm. we send the samples to them they assess them internally and they put in an order which has happened in the past before we send all of our product specifications and have a chat with the procurement heads at this time as well so you know both are options right now that we are um you know, in the process of um, getting through, but it is it is quite hard to, especially at this time. You'd think, oh, the NHS they they'd love anyone who can supply them PPE, especially yeah, specialist PPE like this. However, they are inundated with requests from suppliers for this, so it is it is quite hard to kind of you know push your way through everyone else and um be a supplier for the, uh, the, this time for the nhs so we've been we've been focusing on the nhs but also a few private medical centers as well that have the power to you know implement these new products and into into their systems a lot quicker and in terms of your raw material uh supply so is that on a certified basis do you have like uh, a specific list that you're targeting that you know is is going to be very good quality materials and appropriate quality 
uh, for selling into hygiene purposes? Yeah, absolutely. So be before we list any um, products in our um, in our product list and our offering, uh, we do a lot of due diligence and testing on our end. We check the certifications multiple times. Um, that unfortunately, there has been so many cases of fraud. Luckily we haven't gone through it, but there's been so many cases of missold PPE, et cetera. Um, so we, we want to avoid that. And luckily we have the knowledge and a, a bit of experience now as to what products are legitimate, what the, what's the materials that we should be looking for in the materials yeah. list, the production process. Um, also some risky versus non-risky companies and countries that we can be um, procuring them from. But yeah, when we, when we uh, look at the R and D side and look at, procuring the fibers for the new products that we want to produce. Um, we always request samples. We always test them. Uh, we, we have some labs that we work with in the UK, some non-woven labs, um, which have been so amazing for us. And we've gotten a lot of prototypes made with them. So it's a very exciting um, stage we're at with our R&D process. And just to come back to the technology and R&D behind all of this. So your specific discipline was on the process engineering side and you've done some personal research into the material side. Where do you believe the IP or well, the future IP of the company with regards to the sustainable um, masks and, and, um, and materials that you're going to produce lies? Is it on the, the processing side that's a difficult part or just putting together the material? I think actually it's a bit of both and also uh, when you look at IP especially with uh, this sort of material you also have to look at the um, what it's going to be used for so yeah. when I when I first started the company one of the first things I did was go to um, a intellectual property company that do do all the patent searches and um, uh, luckily there's a lot of these so you can you can literally walk in with an idea um, fill out a form that they have and they will do a free patent search Oh, wow. like a, a very very brief one very on the surface one uh, with some keywords and um they'll let you know oh okay this hasn't been done before you might potentially have an opportunity to do um to register an ip for this i did that with the research that i had done uh, a few years ago and i found that there was actually a gap in the design world a gap in the market uh for this kind of material and uh the feedback that i received was the combination of fibers that I had in the um, uh, manufacturing process to actually process these fibers and, and make a non-woven fabric from them um, mm -hmm. for the medical use um, has IP potential. So I think that's, uh, that's kind of where uh, we're going towards with our long-term eco-friendly non-woven fabrics. In terms of building out the business and, and the day-to-day -day mechanics. I understand you're on a very lean team. Who's in it with you for the ride? So, I mean, currently it is largely me. Uh, <laughs> luckily, I can do a lot of the design work. So I've, I've been putting multiple hats on with web design um, all the way through to sales, product design, you know, mocking up all the... Um, uh, packaging that we've been doing, getting everything ordered in. And luckily, the logistics end of it, we have a partner that takes care of the logistics end. Okay. Um, but I, I think since um, since we're quite small at the moment, while while our sales are growing, we can keep things quite centralized. It's, it's not too bad. We are quite self-sufficient and we have the resources in place and we're building up a pretty tight you know, supply chain. So I think things are manageable for now, but I think definitely in the future, we, we're going to need some help. So what I'd like to round off with is just a, a quick question I always ask um, at the end of every meeting. Are there any interesting anecdotes or difficult challenges that you'd have to overcome in bringing the business to this level of development? Yeah, I mean, it, it's been a pretty wild year for us, as you can imagine. Um, we I started the company thinking that we'd be doing R&D for two years, and we've ended up doing a lot of business and within our first year alone we're making a profit we're making revenue we have um, started talking to customers so early on so it really just goes to show you have to be as adaptable as possible because you have no idea what can happen in business Radhika Srinivasan thank you very much for your time thank you so much it's been a pleasure